My name is Brad Ack. I'm the CEO of an organization called Ocean Visions. If we can get the slides up, I'd appreciate it. Uh, the title of this session in the um, program was something about, is carbon removal potentially useful for ocean health, ocean conservation? That's not actually my title. My title is Advancing Solutions for Ocean Climate Restoration. And I want to just say a word about that. Right now, we are not on a track for climate restoration or ocean restoration. Net zero by 2050 is worse off than we are now, right? I just want to make sure that we level set, that everybody recognizes that we are working towards a goal collectively to be worse off in 2050 than we are now, which I find really hard to tell my kids personally, uh, so I don't work on that goal. I'm working on the goal of trying to restore the ocean and the climate, and I believe that we can do it, but we need to have a different agenda. We need to have a much expanded agenda from the one that we have now. So quickly, I work for an organization that sits at the center of a powerful network of academic and research institutions, and we exist to try to develop innovative and durable solutions to these really complex challenges facing the ocean and the climate. And there really is no challenge more threatening to the ocean than the climate crisis. The climate crisis and the ocean crisis are the same thing. The ocean is 70% of the planet. It regulates much of the climate. You cannot extricate the health of the ocean from the health of the climate and vice versa. Hence the little infinity symbol. These two things are linked to each other. Why is that? Well, first, we are trapping enormous amounts of heat on the planet as a result of this blanket of greenhouse gas that we've put into the atmosphere. And that's a calculation, 345 plus or minus two zettajoules since 1955. It didn't start in 1955, that's just this plot. Now, does anybody know what a zettajoule is? A joule is a basic unit of heat and zeta is 23 zeros behind that. Still probably doesn't make a lot of sense. It's an enormous amount of heat. Uh, last year into the ocean, we put 14 zeta joules of heat, which is about five or six times more than we produce as human society. So that's just excess heat being trapped by these greenhouse gases going into the ocean. That's a, a graphic that just shows how much we've heated up the ocean in 120 years. This is a gigantic system, and we have literally heated almost the whole thing, mostly in the upper 700 uh, meters, but we're actually heating the lower ocean as well. This is the most important stress on the ocean, bar nothing else. Not plastics, not dredging, not fishing. Those are all important, but nothing is transforming the ocean like this. So what does thermal stress do? First, it contributes almost half of all the sea level rise that we're experiencing because water expands as it gets warmer, which is inundating coastal ecosystems, changing uh, biological communities, and will only continue. Warmer water holds less oxygen, so we see deoxygenation across the ocean. We have these marine heat waves that we can actually track uh, very, uh, very specifically that cause, among other things, coral bleaching. We're seeing interrupted mixing between the top layer of the ocean and the mid layer where the nutrient exchange happens because of this increasing uh, difference in temperature between those two layers. And that's what feeds the base of the food chain is this, this uh, mixing. Much more powerful storms. I'm here a day late because I got delayed on the west coast of the US it, with blizzards in Los Angeles, uh, which is not something that happens very often. Increased melt of sea ice and ice sheets and poleward migration of marine animals. So again, nothing touches this in terms of impact to the ocean. And yet, we're here at an ocean conference talking about a lot of problems, they're all important, but this is an existential threat to the ocean and to us, and we're not having much of a conversation about what we might do about it. The second big stress from too much greenhouse gas is chemical. We're, not only depositing all this heat in the ocean, but about 30% of all of our CO2 emissions to date have ended up in the upper layer of the ocean. Not safely in the bottom layer, but in the upper layer where they're causing a significant change in ocean acidity and corrosiveness, which again impacts a lot of life in the ocean, anything that forms shells, and there's a lot of that, again at the base of the food chain in the form of phytoplankton. 
So um, that plot just shows you the decline in pH uh, from the norm of 8.1. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot in November of 2010. This again is a situation that is only increasing. So will our current, pro our current approach net zero by 2050 solve this problem? Well, first of all, we have not stopped emitting fossil fuels. We keep setting record upon record. And every year since we've been negotiating climate treaties, that curve has gone up, except for 2019 because of COVID. And the world's 60 largest banks since Paris was signed have invested $4.6 trillion in new fossil fuel infrastructure. So betting on this horse alone to cool the planet, cool the ocean is a really risky bet. And we're, again, we're tilting towards a target that isn't necessarily safe. There's not a climate scientist who will say 1.5 is safe and that's where we ought to be going. They just say it's less bad than 1.6 and a little worse than 1.4 and definitely less bad than two. This was a political science target, not a science target. The safe numbers have been exceeded quite some time ago and the only path to safety is to go backwards. Uh, and as you can see that, you know, the risk, they're just continuums. There's not a bright line of risk. So we need an expanded uh, climate plan for the ocean and for the climate. Um, and we need two additional areas in addition to continuing to focus on reducing emissions. The first is we have to clean up gigatons of legacy carbon pollution. And this is not just me saying this, the IPCC is very clear about this. And the third part is that we're probably going to have to intervene to keep key parts of the system functioning. Because there are parts that are so important, like Arctic ice, like the West Antarctic ice sheet, that we can't afford to let them tip into a different state because it, the whole game can be lost. So I'm gonna talk mostly about the second one, but I just wanna say there are a lot of ways the ocean can contribute to decarbonization. And there's a great report from the high level panel that shows there's about 20% of our total decarbonization target could be met by offshore renewables, by blue foods, uh, decarbonizing shipping. But I wanna talk more about the second big bucket of cleaning up legacy carbon pollution. So this is the 1.5 report put out by the IPCC in 2016, I believe. Um, every pathway they modeled, every scenario to get to 1.5 that didn't involve what they call overshoot required carbon removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons over the course of the century. Now, a gigaton is 1,000, right? So 1,000 a, a gigatons is a, is a trillion tons. 100 gigatons is a, excuse me, a, a gigaton's a billion tons, so 100 billion tons to 1,000 billion tons. And again, this is just to get to that place that's worse off than we are now. And these numbers were from 2016. They've actually increased their numbers and their calculations in the AR3 report that came out last year. So it's not a question of if we're going to do carbon removal. We have to do carbon removal. The only question is where it's going to come from. And that's not going to be a single answer. It's going to come from dozens and dozens and dozens of places. So how are we doing on it so far? This report just came out this year. And basically, we're removing about 2 billion tons a year, so 2 gigatons, but almost entirely through land-based strategies. And only a very, very tiny fraction comes from these so-called novel CDR techniques, as they say in the report, which includes for them things like BEX, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture, biochar, direct air capture. But notice there's not even a single, they don't even identify oceans as a potential novel pathway in this report. But they do say the next decade is critical to move this field forward because we're gonna need an exponential curve of growth. But we have to set the foundation in place to get to a point where we can have that exponential curve. So why should we talk about the ocean? This graph is not to scale. It's not even close. If it was to scale, everything but the deep and intermediate ocean uh, aside from the continental crust would appear very small. There's 50 times more carbon in the bottom of the sea, deep blue carbon, a uh, term coined by one of our colleagues, um, that is um, an, mostly inert, largely safe. And if we could increase that amount by 1%, we could deal with our atmospheric carbon problem. So. The potential for the ocean is huge. If we were to disappear tomorrow, 
A few hundred thousand years from now, the ocean would cycle all this carbon back down into the deep. And it does that through biological methods and geochemistry methods. So the biological methods are anything that photosynthesizes has the potential for capturing carbon. And then whether you can store that carbon is a technological question. It does, there is a natural process of carbon through marine snow going to the bottom of the sea, but it's a little bit slower and a little bit less than what we might get with technology interventions. But you have photosynthesis. And then geomimicry is mimicking the process where alkaline ions wash off the land through rainfall and, and rock weathering into the ocean, increasing ocean alkalinity and allowing the ocean to take more carbon out of the atmosphere. These are the two key pathways. At Ocean Visions, we've done some maps, and I would commend you to this website if you want to learn more about technologies and the state of those technologies. We mapped three big areas of uh, ocean-based CDR, electrochemistry, macroalgae, and ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, we've just added one more on microalgae. It just went up uh, a couple of days ago, and we're about to finish one this year on, on living blue carbon. Each of these maps, they're digital, they're not documents, they're, you, you could bounce around with them. They have three components, state of the technology, development gaps and needs, um, and first order priorities. If you click on state of the technology, it'll give you an overview of various technologies, their readiness level, environmental risks and benefits. If you click on development gaps and needs, you'll see what some of the most critical um, things are, the, the obstacles that we have to overcome. And then finally, uh, new modeling tool, excuse me, first order priorities will give you a whole range of uh, what are the most important things to work on right now to move these technologies forward to determine whether they will be part of that carbon removal mountain that we have to climb. And then if you further click on a particular area, in this case, accelerating controlled field trials, which we find to be one of the most important priorities, you will actually get to some data and you'll see there's a couple projects appended down in the bottom left corner. Um, people are putting their work here. This is designed to be interactive. It's designed for to build a community of uh, makers and solvers and inventors and scientists to work together to advance these technologies. Um, we've been working to mobilize a lot of effort around first order priorities. I'm not gonna uh, dwell on this, but we also are supporting through science and engineering advice key innovators in the space. And these are just six companies, some of whom are in the room, who are all competing for the $100 million carbon removal X prize uh, that will be decided in a couple of years. And um, you know, these are just some of the people working in the space to try to actually make this a going enterprise. Just quickly before I end, I wanna to touch this third area. It wasn't on the agenda, but this is about ecosystem repair. Even if we're wildly successful with carbon removal and wildly successful with decarbonizing our entire economy, we still are facing enormous risks of change on the planet that it might be irreversible. There are a whole series of these tipping points, and you can see them here sort of color-coded by where they start to become dangerous. So in the yellow, it's pretty much right now, and you have the Greenland ice sheet. We've been hearing a lot about the loss of mass there. Arctic summer sea ice, the West Antarctic ice sheet. I don't know how many of you saw the Doomsday Glacier report uh, uh, in nature a few weeks ago. And then things get worse as it gets hotter. But the problem with things like Arctic sea ice is that as they melt, they actually contribute positively, not really positively, but a positive feedback loop to further warming the climate by having less planetary albedo. So we need to think about what is going to be the generation of interventions that slows this down. And we're never going to know whether we can do anything about it until we try. So the first thing is we have to start having the conversation. This is from our colleagues uh, in, at the Great Barrier Reef. They're trying everything. They're trying shading. They're trying upwelling. They're trying marine cloud brightening. These are the kind of things that will be the future of conservation and planetary management over the next 50 to 80 years if we are to have a livable planet. Solar geoengineering is on that list. It's sad that we're at this point, nobody wants to have to think about doing this, but emergency intervention to stop the heat from continuing to accumulate uh, has to happen. And by the way, while we've been talking, the amount of heat going in the ocean is equivalent to about seven Hiroshima bombs of energy every second. Every second of every minute, every hour of every day, that's what those Zeta Joules are. And again, that ain't turning off until we actually reduce those numbers. 
So if you want to talk more about this, we're having a, a big meeting in Atlanta that's dedicated to nothing but ocean solutions across marine ecosystem repair, carbon removal, decarbonization. It's in April, the 4th to the 6th. Love to see you there. Thank you.